So I'd like to go over some of the SAR data sets that are available for, from ASF. As Sarah mentioned, the Alaska Satellite Facility is one of 12 distributed active archive centers for EOSDIS. We are the SAR specialists, so we maintain NASA's archive of SAR data, which includes both data sets that NASA collected itself, but also data sets from partner agencies. We have data, our data in the Earth data search, but if you're interested in specifically SAR data, you may find it a little portal, our Vertex portal, which is just the SAR data that we serve. In order to download the data, you will need Earth Data login credentials, and this is an EOSDIS-wide user registration, so many of you may already have an Earth Data account. If you don't, I encourage you to visit the urs.earthdata.nasa.gov site and sign up and get a, an account. It's free, it's very quick and easy to sign up, and then you have access to all of the data that are um, served by the DACs. The first time you log in to, to Vertex, if you visit, you can sign in with your Earth Data credentials. And at that point, you will be prompted the first time you visit to accept the ASF end user license agreement. And once you've done that, you can download our data sets without any additional steps. Our Vertex portal went over, went a complete overhaul a little over a year ago. And um, if you haven't visited Vertex for a while, or if you're new to Vertex, I encourage you to check out the What's New button. There are new features that are being added all the time, and uh, this gives uh, some hints of some of the new things that are available. I'll mention just a few things that have happened in the last year. Uh, the baseline and SBOS tools have been integrated into Vertex, and I'll go over that in the next couple of slides in more detail. For some of our data sets, there, many of our data sets actually are served as zip archives, and some of them you may not need to download the entire archive, and so for those data sets, it, we now allow you to look in and see what, what that zip archive contains and just download the parts that you want if that makes sense for your particular application. There are more area of interest um, options in the new Vertex. So you can either just use a, a geographic search and draw in an area of interest using the tools that are available in the UI. But if you already have a shapefile or a, um, or a JSON or a KML, you can also just import that so that you don't have to duplicate work and use that to find your, your search area. If you log in to Earth Data, it gives you the opportunity to save searches, and it also keeps track of your search history, so you can go back and see what you've looked for in the past. It's also very easy to share searches because the entire search um, parameters are actually included in the URL. So if you've done a search and you have results that you're pleased with and you want to share them with a colleague, all you have to do is copy the URL email it to them, they can paste it into their browser, and they will see the exact same result set that you see. So the baseline tool is designed to help you choose granules that are suitable for interferometry. If you're, doing inter if you're making an interferogram, you need two acquisitions. If you've done a search and you find the, the scene that you want to use as your reference granule, you can click on the baseline tool option, which will open this interface. The granule that you selected will be shown in the crosshairs of the baseline map or the baseline uh, um, chart. And all of the other granules that you might consider using to create an interferogram are shown in the, with these gray dots. You can click on any one of the dots to learn more about that particular scene and add it to your cart if you'd like. When you're considering the, the pairs that are appropriate for an interferogram, it depends on what you want to actually um, encompass in your interferogram. So if you're interested in looking at the change that was driven by a specific event, like a volcano or an earthquake, you, you, you ideally want to have two images that bracket that event as closely as possible. So you'd want to find the image that was 
collected as soon before and as soon after that event as you can. This way, any of the change you see is more likely driven by your event of interest. Whereas if you had images that were three months apart, it will, it will um, capture the change that occurred due to your event of interest, but there may have been other things that happened as well. And so your signal may not be as clear as if you can focus in on that time period when it actually took place. On the other hand, you might be interested in longer term processes. So if you're looking at subsidence, for example, due to groundwater depletion, you might not see any changes in a 12 day period. So in, in a situation like that, you may actually want a, an annual interferogram where you, you take an image from April 15th of one year and as close to April 15th on the second year and compare them to see the kind of those long term changes. And by uh, selecting at the same time of year, it reduces the seasonal variability that may be present due to vegetation or other um, natural processes on the landscape. So you can see there are two axes on, in the baseline map, the perpendicular and the temporal axis. So the perpendicular baseline is how far apart the images were acquired in space. And so if you have specific requirements on how close the acquisition locations need to be, you can look for, for um, granules that are along that zero line and those will be closest together in space in terms of where they were acquired. And then the other consideration is that temporal baseline, how far apart they are. So this just gives you a, a visualization of all of the potential granules. It is important to note that there is a critical baseline. So um, the images have to be acquired within a certain distance of each other in space. Otherwise they lose coherence and you don't get a valid interferogram. So this only shows you uh, the granules that, are, that fall within that critical baseline. So the SBOS tool takes the baseline kind of one step further. Again, you'd find a, a granule of interest, click on the SBOS tool option and it opens the interface. Again, each one of the granules is indicated by a dot, but what's really important for SBOS are the pairs. So you're creating stacks of interferogram pairs. So each one of these lines is a short baseline pair. And if you're, so this allows you to do time series analysis with interferograms where you can identify a series of short baseline pairs that you create interferograms for each one of those pairs and then do additional analysis to look at the data. This interface gives you the opportunity to set constraints on your baselines, both the perpendicular and the temporal. So if you had certain conditions where you wanted your, your perpendicular baseline to be within a certain distance, you can use the slider bar to set that tolerance. And similarly, similarly for the temporal tolerance, if you, if you only want images that were acquired within 16 days of each other to be paired, then you can move the slider down so that it, it sets that tolerance lower. ASF has a number of historic data sets that we serve, again, both from NASA and partner agencies. They date back to the first spaceborne star mission in 1978 with NASA's CSAT, but there is a wide variety of data available. These are historic missions, they're no longer active, but we do keep that data archived and available for download. So if you're looking to compare with some historic data, these are these are options to use as those for those comparisons. We do have a couple of data sets that are restricted from partner agencies, which means that you have to um, submit a research agreement with them. It's still free, it doesn't cost anything, but there is an extra step of being approved for research. And that's the, the JURS and the RadarSat-1 missions, but everything else, it, you don't need any additional permissions to download and use the data. We also support missions that are ongoing. So the UAVSAR mission will be used in the GeoGateway tutorial later in the course. And this is an airborne mission. So the sensor is attached to an aircraft rather than a satellite. It collects in quad pole L-band and it's been active since 2008. It, the missions are fairly targeted. So if you look at this map of Alaska, you can see that the areas that are covered by UAVSAR missions are, are fairly targeted and they, they're not frequently repeated. So there may be repeat passes just to create an interferogram, but it doesn't mean that 
it will be imaged again the next year, for example. But if this data was collected in an area that's of interest to you, it's a very rich data set. There are lots of, of products that are included and can be downloaded and used. Another ongoing mission is the Soil Moisture Active Passive mission. This is a, a, a NASA mission that was launched in 2015. And originally, it had both an active and a passive microwave sensor. And the idea was to collect high resolution soil moisture data globally. Unfortunately, the SAR sensor, the active sensor, malfunctioned a few months into the mission. And so we, the passive sensor is still going, but with the loss of the SAR sensor, we lost the high resolution part of that equation. So there is still soil moisture data that's been generated the entire time, but when it's only the passive sensor, sensor used, it's, it's fairly coarse resolution, but it's still good for regional analysis or for kind of larger scale projects. In recent years, there's been a, um, an effort to incorporate other SAR data sets as a proxy for that original SMAP SAR sensor. So there are now products available that make use of Sentinel-1 data, for example, to kind of tighten up that resolution of the data set. So if you're interested in soil moisture, I encourage you to check out the SMAP website, which points you to the various data repositories for the SMAP data. Most of the higher level products are uh, served from NSIDC DAC, but there are links in the, on the SMAP website. The, our largest data set and our most commonly accessed at this point is the Sentinel-1 data set. This is a European Space Agency mission, which is part of the Copernicus mission. Sentinel-1 has global coverage with C-band SAR, and it, it's a two satellite constellation. The first one was launched in 2014, and then the second one was launched two years later. These two satellites are in the exact same orbit, but they're offset 180 degrees. And this is great because each one of those satellites has a 12-day repeat cycle, but because they're offset, it means that one of the two satellites is passing over the same part of the Earth at, from, and looking at the same angle every six days. New data collected with Sentinel-1 is available for download within three days of acquisition and usually within 24 hours of acquisition. It's free and easy to download in several formats, including RAW, SLC, GRD, and OCN. Often people are not sure which data set they um, should use. And so I'd like to go over just quickly some of the Sentinel-1 data sets and, and what is required for specific applications. The raw data sets are really only for SAR specialists. If you're, if you're not interested in, in walking through the entire calibration and um, processing steps yourself, the, the raw data is not going to be of much use. But the European Space Agency has processed to level one data for you, a single look complex and a ground, ground range detected product. And for most SAR users, those two products are going to be um, the most commonly useful. There's also a higher level product generated from the level one products, um, which is focused on ocean applications, um, waves and wind directions. So the GRD versus the SLC, the GRD is suitable for amplitude applications. So if all you want to do is generate an RTC image, the radiometric terrain corrected image, and look at the backscatter, a GRD is going to be your first step. That's, that's the product you need for processing. It's fairly easy to use. It's been uh, geo-referenced and it's all multi-looked into one single image. So if you bring this into a GIS environment, it will show up in place and more or less represent um, that area on Earth. It's not radiometrically terrain corrected, however, so you'll still have those distortions. The SLC is made up of three different geotiffs. So each one of the subswaths is actually a different data set. And each radar burst is included in the data. So if you look above and below these grid lines, which indicate the, the individual bursts, you'll see that the data is actually um, is actually repeated above and below. Each burst actually overlaps the other, but all of the data is preserved in this data set. And so the image is a little bit distorted if you're using it as an image. So if you just wanna take a look at the data rather than process it, it's easier to use the GRD. But if you want to create interferometry products, 
you will need to use the complex data set. So the single look complex from Sentinel-1 is what you would need to create an interferogram. The GRD no longer contains the phase information, it's only amplitude. So if you want to work with the, the phase data, you will need the SLC. So again, the GRD is quick and easy to use for amplitude applications, while the SLC is necessary for interferometry. We're really excited to look towards the NISAR mission, which Sarah mentioned already. It's launching in due to launch in 2022 and a joint venture between NASA and the Indian Space Research Organization. There will be an L-band sensor as well as an S-band sensor. The L-band will be collecting global data sets, while the S-band sensor is going to be more focused on specific areas of interest. It has a 12-day average repeat cycle, which is um, the same repeat cycle as Sentinel-1. And what we're really excited about is that there will be analysis-ready products available right off the bat. So you won't have to download a GRD and then do additional RTC processing you will have analysis ready data available for download without any additional steps. We do have a few analysis ready data sets that are available directly on Vertex at this point. And so I just want to go through quickly some of these resources. You can download ALOS Pulsar RTC products. We have the ALOS Pulsar 1, a subset of the ALOS Pulsar 1 mission, and all of our holdings have been processed to RTC. So if you search for the ALOS Palsar mission in Vertex and under the filters section, you can set the file type to just look for terrain corrected products. And these are RTC products. The high resolution is at a 12.5 meter pixel spacing and the low resolution is 30 meter pixel spacing. They're projected to UTM and you can download them and use them directly in a GIS environment or in other analysis platforms. We also have a limited set of Sentinel-1 interferograms. These are already processed and uh, are available for use. Either you can download an, a full net CDF product, or if you prefer to work with GeoTIFFs, you can um, just download specific layers that you're interested in and work with them as GeoTIFFs. To find those, you just look for the S1 INSAR beta products and uh, search for uh, these interferograms. I should mention that it, they're fairly restricted geographically, so they aren't, they aren't everywhere, but they are generally in geologically interesting places. So it, it may be that your area of interest has these interferograms available, so it's worth checking out. And even if it's not available for your area of interest, if you're, if you're interested in learning about working with interferograms, this is a great resource for getting your hands on some already processed interferograms that you can interact with and, and see how they work and how it might work for your applications. UAVSAR will be mentioned a little bit more later, but the UAVSAR products include a KMZ package which are geo-referenced products that you can bring into um, Google Earth Pro or other platforms that support KMZ. And it includes images of, of interferograms as well. So that's another great place to get, to get interferometry. There are also polarimetry products and the amplitude and correlation products that were generated as part of the, um, um, as part of the acquisitions are also generated to the KMZ format. And this is really exciting. I'll be going over it more in the session on flood mapping this afternoon. But just as of Tuesday, we now have available on-demand processing for RTC products. So I'll go over this again, but I just wanted to give you a little teaser. Super exciting. You can generate your own RTC products from any of the Sentinel-1 um, data sets on demand. This is based on our hype hybrid pluggable processing pipeline that we've been working on the last few years to leverage cloud computing for generating SAR products, higher level SAR products. So currently on Vertex, we only offer um, RTC processing on demand, but we do have other processes that we're, that we're working on for hopefully um, inclusion on Vertex. But if you're interested in looking into INSAR products or change detection products, you can also check out our beta platform, our, our Hype version one, um, which you can have access to in exchange for feedback. So if you're interested in exploring some of those other options, you can check out the Hype website. 
And lastly, we do have data recipes available at ASF. So these are step-by-step -step instructions that walk you through how to process and work with SAR data sets. So that's an, another resource if you're wanting to um, understand more about doing the processing yourself. And with that, I will... Heidi, we have one question sure. from the chat. Eric Baer wants to know if you're measuring deformation. I assume your DEM is no longer correct and your RTC will not be correct. How do you deal with that? Or is that not important for phase data? Uh, it's important. So, um, it, yeah, it depends on, on what you're doing, uh, for sure. So the RTC, um, our products are generally on the order of 30 meter or 10 meter products. The, D the quality of the DEM certainly impacts the quality of your RTC. The better your DEM, the better your RTC product is going to be. However, in, in, for most cases, um, if, if it doesn't align quite perfectly for amplitude um, applications, that, that may not be a, a big deal. But it's certainly true that the, the higher quality your digital elevation model is, the higher quality your RTC product will be. And in terms of the phase, um, the phase processing, it really depends what you're what you're doing with that um, with that phase data. So it it all kind of depends on your on on your particular application. And um, yeah, it, it, as the case often with SAR, it, it depends. <laughs> 